Well, hello, and welcome to uh, Blue Table Talk. Um, I'm your host, Senior Master Sergeant Candace Helder, and I'm joined today by a lovely group of experts. Today, we're going to have a conversation on preventing harmful behavior uh, within the Air Force, and we're going to specifically take a, a look at uh, how alcohol plays into that. This is often a conversation that um, is not uh, usually discussed. However, we have seen an uptick um, in harmful behaviors across our Air Force. Um, specifically as it relates to alcohol. So we're going to go ahead and have that conversation. I want to begin with a recent change to our administrative discharge process regarding civilian convictions. Major Campbell, can you talk about how this change affects airmen convicted of a DUI? Absolutely. Um, so in the context of alcohol-related incidents, um, one of our constant challenges is how do we address DUI problems? How do you address DUI? It's something that is always kind of in the the context when we're talking about alcohol-related incidents. Um, so a recent change in the AFI um, for discharges is a mandatory discharge processing for airmen convicted of DUIs off base. Um, now, the, the AFI governs civilian convictions in general, but what gets roped up in there is DUIs. Um, so that has some serious career impacts um, for airmen um, who are convicted. Now, before the change, um, commanders could initiate discharge for airmen convicted of DUIs, um, but in practice, that's not usually how it happens, um, especially for um, folks who it's maybe their, their first kind of incident of misconduct. Um, but now, you know, if somebody is barely over the limit and gets that DUI conviction off base, um, the commander has to initiate discharge um, processing. Um, there is a waiver process, but um, typically what you're going to see is it's an airman, regardless of, of their rank or um, their, their prior record, you're going to see them facing um, the end of their career. Yes, I appreciate that. Um, as, as we continue, Ms. Ms. Rose and Ms. Gonzalez, so as a Sarkin VA, do you believe there is a direct link between our sexual assault members in the Air Force and our culture around alcohol? Uh, yes, so um, we believe that if members have military sexual trauma, then they're at an increased risk for substance use disorders. Um, so we know that a high percentage of our sexual assault incidents include drinking habits. You're, um, if you're talking with OSI mm -hmm. or if you're victims, then we know that a lot of those incidents include drinking, whether that's the victim or the offender. Um, if it is the victim, um, they kind of sometimes tend to use alcohol as a coping mechanism. Um, once they tend to seek services, whatever kind of treatment that is, uh, they tend to have three times more likelihood of a diagnosis for alcohol use disorder as somebody that's seeking treatment without a military sexual trauma history. We also have a few other implications here at Milton Hall. Um, so the risk for um, sexual trauma and then DUIs is the same uh, rank system. So it's going to be those E1 through E4. So those young airmen that are here um, at Milton Hall tend to be most at risk for um, sexual assaults and DUIs. Uh, finally, so one of the last stats that I came across, there's a workplace um, and gender relations survey. Mm -hmm. And so what they found is 62% of sexual assaults for women and 49% of sexual assaults for men um, include alcohol use by the victim or the offender. Um, those stats are really high. Mm -hmm. You know, those are really high stats. Um, those are also from the 2018 report because there's not stats in the 2021 report. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the report that goes on Sacra.mil. They... Um, have not put that information for 2021, um, which I think looking at all the agencies here, we all know that all of us have an implication with alcohol, whether it's sexual assault, suicide, family violence. Um, so I'd like to see those stats just to get a further idea of how we're continuing to see alcohol use um, affecting these departments. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I think to circle back to your question, does the culture around drinking, is it related to sexual violence? And kind of like Lisa touched on, it absolutely is. We know when we look at the culture of the military, um, and I'm gonna speak in kind of like vague terms, it's a hyper-masculine organization, right? And so what does it mean to be masculine? It means you use aggression when you need to. It means maybe it's more manly to be able to have a lot of sex, to be able to hold your liquor, to um, you know some of these toxic masculinity traits and even though we're working on more gender equality and healthier views of gender, we still have some of the residual effects of 
old, really um, dichotomous ideas about what it means to be a man or a woman. Um, I think it's important to note that alcohol does not cause sexual assault, just like I know Mr. Nelson will touch on domestic violence as well, but it is a risk factor. And so like Lisa said, over half of women who are sexually assaulted are um, under the influence of alcohol and um, about half of men are under the influence of alcohol. Um, and while these numbers are concerning, they're actually probably really low um, estimates. Um, there's a lot of reason why people don't report, and I'm specifically speaking towards women because that's what the research is on. Women some are fear they're not gonna be supported. And that's actually confirmed by research that if they are intoxicated, Will this language be, why do they drink so much? Will it be, you know, why did he go home with him being so impaired? Um, and these questions really, I think, support drinking culture, right? You should be able to handle your alcohol. Um, when we think about how we address victims, I think um, what we're trying to switch the conversation to is more perpetrator-centric, you know? Not, why did she drink so much? Why was she wearing that? Um, but we also know perpetrators are at risk to engage in violence if they're intoxicated as well. And it's kind of, you know, there's there's some different data on why this is. Do perpetrators seek out alcohol to have an excuse down the road as to why they perpetrated? Or does the alcohol disinhibit them to engage in violent behavior? And again, there um, we need more, more research and more data on that. We know that the most likely sort of scenario, both victim and perpetrator are drinking alcohol. And part of that is because in social contexts where one is drinking, the other's probably drinking too. And so when we think about the Air Force and we think about social situations where um, sexual violence or violence occurs, you know, there's a lot of drinking that occurs across the Air Force. We have some units with bars in, in the units. We have the grog bowl, you know, our Air Force ball, we have alcohol. Um, oftentimes it's normal to go to the club and drink after work. And so um, this is gonna be a highly likely opportunity for both perpetrator and victim to both be drinking. Um, and just kind of one last thing I wanna to touch on, if you do have people in the community who want to engage in violence, oftentimes they don't even have to go out and drug their victim or feed their victim alcohol. This is happening kind of in our normal social context across the Air Force as a whole. Thank you for that, it's interesting. I'm thinking of a uh, book by Malcolm Gladwell, Talking to Strangers, mm -hmm. where they talk about the alcohol culture. Well, they talk about the alcohol culture um, within the college community um, and how we get after having that discussion about uh, how alcohol has these effects. No, we don't want to blame alcohol or demonize alcohol, but how do we get after knowing that these things uh, correlate to this type of behavior? But yeah, that's such a good point because I think awareness is a huge piece in how we behave. Um, and I'm sure, you know, Captain will talk about this, but it impairs, it impairs us. It's a drug. Right. Um, and so if you're a man, um, and I'm using some gender um, specific language, but if you're a man who's initiating sex, which is normal in our culture for the men to initiate and the female or woman to say yes or no, if you're under the influence of a substance, it's actually more likely that you could misperceive that person's interest in you. And then let's say that person rejects you. If that person rejects you, if you're impaired, you don't have the same capability to rectify the situation and know how to handle that. So you may pursue that sexual contact still, um, or be so embarrassed that violence may still occur, but we know that it, it, it is a mind-altering substance, so I think that that's a really good point. Thank you. Mr. Nelson and Ms. Moses, um, as the DAVA, can you speak to negative impacts of alcohol that you see in the family advocacy program cases in our community? Um, so as Ms. Abby mentioned, um, I'm a big proponent in saying to people, alcohol, is not a reason why you commit you know, physical assault or sexual assault against your partner or your family, right? Um, for me, so when we see alcohol, we look at it as can you compare someone's judgment to make a decision, mm -hmm. right? And what we see in our, in our families is domestic violence happens occurs over time, right? And when somebody drinks alcohol, it just takes that trigger uh, to increase that risk, mm -hmm. whether it's, it starts from emotional and then something happens where the individual drinks. Um, and then it just escalates to physical violence or sexual assault. Uh, as Abby mentioned, um, those lines can sometimes be blurred in that intimate um, moment um, where someone perceives their advances in court. Okay. Uh, so that's what we tend to see. Yeah, I see a lot of families <coughs> coming on the therapy side who are doing anti 
we're like, oh, it's just the alcohol side of it. But when we dig a little deeper and we talk about the history of the relationship, oftentimes there's best interest. But because they're not under the influence, they don't they don't say the things that are sometimes on their mind, and they don't do what they sometimes maybe want to do. But because alcohol is playing its role, they let loose, and those guards and those boundaries and those, those filters are no longer there. And so that's when we really have a lot of work to do, is acknowledging that it's not just the alcohol that cause it. There are other things that we need to work on in that support corner. A lot of families are under a lot of financial stress in the military. <coughs> TYs um, and deployments are really big in the community. Um, so there's a lot of stressors. Um, young children as well. Um, that's why in family advocacy we have two registered nurses on our team that are there specifically for those individuals because of that high stress. Yeah, I think something that I also saw that you just jogged my memory on is, um, you know, obviously reiterating alcohol is not the cause of violence. When you look at sexual perpetrators um, uh, of acquaintance of sexual assault, oftentimes they come from violent homes. And I, I believe it's the same from a family advocacy standpoint. It's sort of, if someone's engaging in violence, it's what they saw, what was modeled for them, because you know they don't have the coping or relationship skills, and then alcohol obviously disinhibits them in those moments. Well, and a lot of people go back to what they're used to and what they know, yeah. especially under high stress times. And for a lot of families, using alcohol to cope is acceptable, right? Mm -hmm. Like that drink at dinner, or maybe another, or maybe a few on weekends. like. So it's really acceptable, and when you have so much stress and you're feeling so much, especially for a lot of families who are over here who don't have that I know a lot of spouses who come in and tell me all day long, if I don't take my kids to school, I'm home by myself. So yeah, I might have a glass of wine when I think about that word. And so it causes this whole idea that you know, there's a lot more to it than just the alcohol, but the alcohol kind of loose lips and really lets yeah. things fly and creates sometimes a bigger situation than what could have been if they had come in early and got some support for some of the financial side or the child care side. Thank you all for those important perspectives. Uh, I do want to switch the conversation over to a violence prevention lens. Uh, Mr. Draper, I, I believe you've been doing violence prevention for a while now. <laughs> uh, a few years. So, all right. So from a violence uh, prevention lens, what are you focused on when looking at our culture around the uh, well, First, let me uh, thank you for taking time to allow us to, to be part of the uh, Blue Paper Talk Club. Uh, what I'm thinking about is how do we keep the conversation going? And I think it's uh, so important, not only at this level of uh, professionals, but how do we get individuals out in the community? How do we get individuals out in the community to be able to have this exact same conversation where it resonates in an individual's mind and makes them ask that question, uh, what do I need to do to ensure we get to a place in time where we can change the culture. Uh, what uh, do where do I need to be where I can boldly say not on my watch? This is not going to take place. Though. I'm constantly thinking about suicide prevention. I'm constantly thinking about sexual assault prevention. I'm always thinking about what's going on in the fat lane and the fat world. I'm thinking about crime prevention overall. I'm thinking about what does a community really look like where we don't have to have this conversation years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. Uh, clearly, uh, we're not uh, unique just because we're a military community. This could be the same conversation could be taking place somewhere in the United States that is a community that's not affiliated with what we do at all. This is what we're dealing with in society. So not only are we talking about trying to change the culture in our world, we're trying to change the culture in society, uh, period. Uh, I think uh, you said the word demonize and Abby said the word demonize also. We don't want to demonize alcohol. That's not what we're trying to do. So we're not saying alcohol is bad. Uh, what we're saying is, is uh, we want to get to a place where we can better take care of ourselves. Uh, we can teach and talk about better taking care of our community members, whether they wear your uniform or whether they wear my uniform or whether they're not attached to this period. And how do we do that? And, I think a, 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 a farther question, what, is that, what does that really look like? What steps do we need to start taking to ensure we are at a place a few years from now or 10 years from now maybe where the culture looks different? Uh, it's a uh, community focused on responsible alcohol drinking. And that's deep. Yeah. I mean, if you want to be honest, I threw that statement out there, but what does that really look like? I think there's a lot of different lanes there. Yeah. You know, I, I know me and you have got to deep discussions Absolutely. about this, but there's a lot of different lanes there on things that I think we can do proactively 
in order to get us to where we need to be. Uh, responsible sales practices. Mm-hmm. Now that's one that people may shake when you say that, but uh, even in our own community, uh, are we are we making uh, alcohol to really live at all times? You know, uh, something that we need to look at. What does effective bystander intervention do? We talk about that all the time, and I think we have some great bystander intervention programs. But what does effective bystander intervention look like? It's going to get to, it's going to get us to a place where we can realize. Change. And are you talking about from a perspective of bartender? Like- yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. That'd be the one. You know, I mean, we do a lot of different bystander intervention training on the installation in, in, in our communities and stuff. But, uh, but is it just uh, 20 minutes and we walk away and I'll see you again next January? Are we serious about it? Were we really having conversations where if I was a bartender, I really know what my responsibility should be when and if I see something that makes the hair of the back of my head. So, you know. uh, but at the end of the day, I, 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 I think it all starts. Over a cup of coffee, mm-hmm. a cup of tea, and we just have these real world conversations and then we move on. Okay. That's right. I, I, I want to just sort of jump on what you said, Ron, because the bystander piece is really important. Um, like, especially with sexual assault prevention, oftentimes we can't, you know, barge into a house or a bedroom or, a, you know, a living room and pull people apart and prevent assault. What we are asking people to do is stop the little stuff. Mm-hmm. And so really the, the little stuff on the continuum of harm, it's not little, it's just less acute. Right. But you know, for us, gendered language, mm-hmm. maybe even casual language about getting drunk, that type of stuff, if we stop it and we start to shift conversations, that is what prevents more acute stuff from happening in our units. And so it, it feels like a big ask, preventing sexual assault, preventing suicide, But when we're out there training, I know Lisa and I like to reiterate, try to notice the the stuff that's on the continuum of harm that's less acute. That's your opportunity for prevention right there. And because you brought up proactive, um, so a proactive approach versus a reactive. And oftentimes, I think because we've been uh, in such a reactive state, right, some of the things that we do, we may believe that they're proactive, but it's really us, you know, reacting still. So it's almost how can we look at or how can we see things coming down the line and start to put in preventative measures mm-hmm. uh, before they can even happen? Yeah. Okay. When we talk about bystander intervention, it's usually at, during an incident, right? So mm-hmm. it's reactive. And so if we can shift that language so that bystander intervention becomes proactive, mm-hmm. um, then I think that also is helpful. Do, for the changes for legal, um, sort of, did they see this coming that DUIs would be affected and is it part of culture change? No. So I, I mean, this is one of the things that's probably just playing out now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, I mean, there's a lot of taking a lot of measures to get out there to commanders' calls, and uh, but we're, we're really seeing like the first kind of wave of mm-hmm. folks who are getting discharged mm-hmm. um, for DUIs. Um, so more to come to see how this might impact. Um, but you know, as far as real world consequences, like this, this is a big one. Um, so we'll, we'll see if you know if it has a, a deterrence um, value. That kind of behavior. Absolutely. I think our community has a likes to protect themselves. Mm-hmm. So in our unit, we have a lot of supervisors, um, first sergeant, superintendent, who we be. We want to protect the member. Mm-hmm. And what's to protect them is in um, not getting in trouble, protecting to take care of them, mm-hmm. right? In their own kind of way. We have a lot of resources in our community that sometimes are not being used. And we have to kind of figure out why that is. Why is a supervisor or a leader so afraid to go to somebody and say, hey, I got this individual here that needs help. How can we help? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's cultural, cultural thing. Um, because I know when I was active duty, if I had somebody who was in trouble, I would try to take care of them in my own way, however I saw fit. Um, I didn't necessarily say, go, hey, let's go to family address and let's go to solve That wasn't the thing that we did. Right. Um, so I think we have to kind of shift that a little bit. Uh, we have all these resources in the community. Let's utilize them. They're there to help. Not, not to be someone's career or get them in trouble. Awesome. Thank you all for the fruitful dialogue uh, thus far. Uh, Captain Murray Robinson. Uh, there was a recent discussion at our community action board, um, and the importance of connections was highlighted. Um, connections, as we know, is a protective factor for suicide prevention. How does connections play a role in reducing the number of alcohol-related incidents in our community? 
I mean, I think this group did a really good job of explaining that already. <laughs> right? um, one of the biggest issues that we have when it comes to alcohol use is mental health concerns. It's the stressors, it's the finance issues, it's the family stuff that's going on. And when we have those issues, we tend to cope with them with alcohol, right? And that's what's been considered maybe socially acceptable to a certain level. It's kind of that like um, that uh, male, you know, piece that you were speaking Absolutely. about, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we cope with it with alcohol, we don't go to mental health, we were just chatting about that, right? There's a stigma mm -hmm. associated with mental health. There's a stigma about family advocacy. There most certainly is a stigma still for ADAPT, right? Mm -hmm. So these resources are being very much underutilized. Then you've got that we're here in England, you know? So anyone that was a support for us back home is no longer, not only are they not here physically, but now you've got a five, six, seven hour difference um, with your family members. And so even that that normal thing in mental health, we'd say like, what social supports do you have? Who can you contact? And they're like, there's nobody here and my family works or when they're getting off of work is when I'm going to bed, right? So those types of things really impact um, the way that they cope. So when it comes to connectivity, you know, it's really important that we are the family. Right, like the, the Air Force is in a really cool, unique, you know, opportunity to take those people who don't feel like they have family, whether they never felt like they had family or feel like they don't have somebody here and create those connections and really help mold and shape the airmen. And so what I'm looking for is that our leadership is there to support our airmen so they're recognizing, for example, like early intervention, preventional stuff. Um, new to the unit, you start to see, you know, your airmen isolating. That's a really good opportunity to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. Our leadership also is really connected with knowing what the resources are, um, but it's about that utilization that you were talking about. Um, you know, helping to decrease the stigma um, associated with, with mental health and ADAPT. And then we also talk a lot about the drinking culture, right? So there's a pretty significant drinking culture. And we have to take into account that some of these women might be coming from, you know, mm -hmm. environments where alcohol was very much a drinking culture, mm -hmm. right? So they haven't learned anything else, and this just feels normal to them. You know, it's our opportunity as leaders and as peers to help kind of curb that and say, hey, listen, you know, we can do activities without all of the alcohol in it. Or, like you said, we're, we're not here to say that alcohol is a, a, a bad thing necessarily, but we want to be able to drink in moderation, right? So being able to model those healthy behaviors as well, um, you know, as a leader showing like having just one or two or maybe just, you know, one in a glass of water or something like that, teaching um, these airmen of how they can drink more responsibility. So the more we have a pulse on our airmen, the better we can help create that, that environment. But as peers, we also have that responsibility as well. You know, um, I'm going to learn best from my peers, mm -hmm. right? Leadership is fantastic, but my peers are really kind of the benchmark for me. And when I'm accountable to my peers, when I feel like I can um, be a good role model and that they are helping to role model those behaviors, I more want to do those, right? Um, so our peers really help us to create that growth, that, that sense of security. They're also probably the ones we're going to go to emotionally, right. right? So less likely to our leadership, but more to our peers to say, hey, I'm struggling, mm -hmm. you know? And it's, it's, like you said, the suicide prevention, being able to ask those questions, like, are you struggling with alcohol? I've noticed that you've been drinking a lot, you know? Being able to talk and communicate those needs, you know, maybe an effective strategy to, to reduce alcohol um, and things as well. I'm glad you brought that point up because you know, we often talk, even when it comes to suicide, how many of us may struggle to even ask someone, yeah. are you thinking of hurting yourself? And that could be a barrier as well that I had not considered, you know, if people have an issue asking someone, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are, are you coping with alcohol? Do you struggle in that life? Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Those are hard questions to ask. They are. They're, no. they're hard because yeah. then you feel a responsibility to do something about right. it. Right. Yeah. And Absolutely. that's the hard part is like, okay, now I know the answer. Now what do I do? Right. Right? Then I take care. Yeah. You don't know your resources. Know your resources. Yeah. resources and connect them to the right organization. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, so as a, as a DEIA practitioner, right, uh, one of the things that I'm keen on is ensuring equity for everyone. 
Um, so I recently read, uh, read a RAND study article that spoke to event-specific strategies that have successfully targeted uh, problematic drinking um, in the civilian community. Excuse me. They hypothesized that the more alcohol-free activities the environment provides and the more airmen choose to participate in activities that do not revolve around the party and culture, then they may be less susceptible to harmful behavior. Do you feel that this is an effective approach or strategy um, within the military? And would this approach level the playing field for non-alcohol, uh, non-drinkers non within the community? Absolutely. I think, I think it'd be a good place to start. Um, I'd be curious um, what the group's thoughts are. But from an equity perspective, you know, Lisa talked about our most at-risk for sexual violence. Uh, alcohol is definitely involved in that, but it's going to be your E1 to E4 females at their first duty station um, and Caucasian, that's our highest numbers. And then women of color are even further more marginalized when you look at actual prevalence rates. Do these women have the same equity in safety when they're going out and they're participating in social events for the military? I would say no. Um, and do non-drinkers have a space? You know, Captain uh, Murray Robinson mentioning our peer influence on us. You know, um, that's what young people are doing, right? They're drinking. And if there's not opportunities to go to non-alcohol related events, do you have the same opportunity to feel safe and to socialize? And I know um, RAND contributes a lot to sexual assault data. And so we look at a lot of their research and they have compared military to what the community has done for harm reduction. And what the community does is look at sort of index events like St. Patrick's Day or even like a 21st birthday celebration for the military, the Air Force ball, promotion parties, and they create a celebratory space that's alcohol free. And so people who don't drink can participate. And then also you're not creating an environment for perpetrators to go and find impaired individuals. You're not creating an environment that makes somebody at risk to misinterpret somebody's you know, sexual intentions at the end of the night. So I don't think there's enough to say, yes, it will be effective, but I think there's enough for us to say, well, let's try and let's see what the data shows down the road to see if it's effective in reducing alcohol-related violence, whether that be suicide, sexual assault, or aggression towards one another. I think it also gives the opportunity to um, give some confidence to people that they can have a good time mm -hmm. without alcohol yeah. being a part of it, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, sometimes we have so much alcohol at all these events that we kind of use it as our crutch yeah. because we feel like we can be more social and, and more, um, you know, close with our peers. But if we have more events that don't rely on alcohol and it kind of forces us to just kind of have those interactions, it helps us to get more motivated, more confident um, in our decisions down the line that we can go to these events and not drink and still have a good time. Thank you for those two perspectives. I'll ask that you join us back for part two as we continue the discussion on preventing harmful behaviors. Welcome back to the Blue Table. So, so far we have been discussing um, preventing harmful behaviors with a specific focus on alcohol. What I would want to ask to uh, you all uh, with me right now again are, are, do you all think that we are equipped enough and are we doing enough to educate our airmen and guardians on what a healthy relationship with alcohol looks like? So I'll start. Okay. So I think uh, I, I think we do a good job. Okay. Really, really. So so uh, and and I can only speak for RAF Miller. I can't speak for the entire Air Force, but uh, I think the Air Force has put uh, uh, great construction tools into violence prevention integrators and into mental health and into SAPR. Our training, I think, is pretty good. So we do talk about this. Uh, do we talk about it often enough? Is the question. So, for example, you know, if you're a brand new amateur and you present yourself to an RAF Miller Hall, you, at a minimum, within your first eight weeks here, you're probably going to get a good six to eight hours, whether it's to FTAC, gear up, one-on-one -on -one training in SAPRA, whether you come to FAP or uh, ADAP or whatever, you're going to get you're going to get flooded with a lot of stuff. Now, that's an interesting time in your career because you get flooded with everything else. So, I don't know how much that soaks in and you actually take with you. I think what we have to think about is how often do we revisit the conversation over an individual's uh, period of being stationed at base X. You know what I'm saying? I think we do a great job of talking about it initially. It's spread out because it's mandatory throughout an individual's tour. But back to what I was saying uh, uh, in the first uh, part of our conversation is, uh, is how do we 
get individuals at the unit level to start talking about this. Because if it's an individual like myself or like you standing in front of a classroom of 30 people having a 45 minute conversation, that hits different than if I work with you, if you know me, we have a personal relationship and Cindy Master Sergeant Candace Hell to sit down with Aaron Draper and has a real world conversation. Now that's what we need to focus on. How do we get individuals to care enough about people to sit down and have real world conversations? Because that's where it's going to actually make a difference. Do you feel like they would have to be honest with themselves first? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. I, I think that's a totally different. <laughs> I think okay. it's a totally different conversation. Okay. Like it's a totally different conversation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I clearly don't want to say that it's only a problem affected brand new accessions. Right. It's not. You know, that's what we were talking about. Right. But this is not just individuals who have only been in the Air Force for a year. Right. This is all of us. Right. It's the culture. Right. So, yes. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think we can handle it the exact same way. You know, we don't need to look at a, uh, at, at a certain age level or a certain rank. How can all of us? Be bold enough to have conversations with each other, uh, with with each other about what we're seeing and how they could benefit from pausing for a minute, talking about your relationship with alcohol and what we need to do to ensure that we are part of culture change. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head too that you can't just talk for talk and to walk mm-hmm. along, right? So it's so important that you have that conversation with yourself first and recognize like where do I use alcohol? Mm -hmm. Is it like in a more healthy manner or is it to cope? Mm -hmm. Um, And how much am I drinking? Mm -hmm. If I'm telling my airmen to, you know, limit their drinking levels, but I'm out at the bar on the weekends, um, that's a a, a difficult thing to to really share, you know, with your airmen. And I feel like airmen know, right? Like I, I feel like there's a total difference when you're coming from a place of understanding and, you know, that you're making that cultural shift versus if you are just kind of outputting the information that you were share, told to share, right? Um, so I think it is really important that you kind of start with your own relationship with alcohol. I think it's a big thing to do geneograms, you know, like when you're doing counseling and you go with your partner, you do geneograms, you need to do a geneogram with alcohol. Mm-hmm. Kind of look at what are your thoughts about it? Where have you seen it before? Yeah. What was your parents' experience with alcohol and really kind of dissect that? Yeah. Yeah, and I think what you're both saying, multiple points in your timeline and your chronology in the military, examining that. Because kind of similar to sexual violence, you may not even know you were sexually assaulted until something happens to you. Maybe you consult with somebody and it's like, oh my gosh, I was assaulted. You may not be drinking a lot when you're 20, but when you're 30 and have three kids under three and you're stressed out, re-examining those criteria can be really important once you're in it because sometimes people just tune us out if the material we're giving them is not relevant to their current space in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any other perspectives on that? I can't remember if we talked a little bit over the break or in this, but we were, we were just kind of addressing it that, you know, when it comes to our relationships with alcohol, that starts before the military and mm-hmm. it starts in childhood, mm-hmm. right? And so, how we saw our family drink or, um, you know, our previous friends from before the military, what their, what their beliefs of alcohol are, really have a significant impact on how we view alcohol. Um, and so that genogram really going back to, yeah. you know, the very beginning to say, okay, you know, where was a potential fault point? It might have been, you know, watching mom and dad drink excessively, right. you know? And so it's, it's hard to educate folks if they don't really understand, you know, where that that belief came from. Right. It's amazing what people think normal is. I can remember a client who was like, yeah, it was 10 drinks, but it was just beer. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, and it's like, well, that's actually the same thing as 10 shots or 10 mm-hmm. glasses of wine. But if you don't know that, if you come from a culture where beer is something that you can consume and drive or that it's, we think it has less of an impact. And that education piece can really help people become more aware of what healthy drinking looks like. Well, I, you know, I, I appreciate the, the fruitful dialogue and I hope discussions like this uh, continue, um, especially at the Blue Table Talk. And so I just want to thank you all for being here with me today. Um, I, I would like to present a, a challenge to the greater audience um, who will be viewing this. When you go back to your units, take inventory of how often we talk about alcohol. Perhaps you could even start a conversation to see if our assessments are in line with what we've discussed today, or maybe they're vastly different. Finally, take inventory of your relationship with alcohol to see if you contribute to a negative culture 
or one of a, a positive culture uh, of healthy alcohol consumption. As the DOD educational campaign goes, own your own limits. Thank you again. We'll see you next time.